down on the call last Monday night with you all and uh, watched the great work that you, you, uh, that you were doing and, and just happy to be with you all again. And so I don't want to take up any more of your time because I know the recommendations have to be in uh, uh, the first draft uh, this coming Friday, I think. That, that is correct. Thank you. We appreciate you being all right, here. All right. Thank you all. Okay, Dia, go ahead. Are, are we doing the data committee update right now or just a general update? Actually doing the, uh, the talking points that we have done already for policy as well as for uh, communities. Great. Thank you, Eric, uh, for the nudge on that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Madam Chair and Madam Vice Chair. Um, we are on track. Um, you know, this this committee is very focused, um, very energetic, um, and very knowledgeable, and is putting together uh, recommendations and has had stuff in the works for the last week or so, ten days. And so, uh, you know, I think the talking points are really what Dwight said, which is this Friday a draft is due, um, and a week from this Wednesday we have the half day planning session. We anticipate that every committee will um, uh, be sure that they are represented by at least two individuals. We hope it's the chair and vice chair and in addition to the data committee representative. So we do hope workforce can send both chair, vice chair and their data representative, which is Daryl Teller. Um, and if not, um, that you can just confirm who might be representing the committee. Um, once we go through the half day planning session, that will help to ensure that we get to look at all recommendations from all three committees. And also we want to ensure that there's a, a general format for all three committees that we all have by the end of the day. Um, there will be an opportunity to use some of the final product, which will be commission questions for candidates for chief um, and to um, really help to refine those uh, coming out of the planning session and have those prepared for um, that Friday um, to submit to the higher committee. Um, so this would be a way for this committee to truly use its knowledge, um, its discussions, um, its priorities to help shape up a couple of questions for um, candidates at that point. Once we have your draft recommendations coming out of the half day planning session, you'll have a little time to refine them further. Um, and um, and bring them to final. Uh, so that's uh, that's the process. Great, thank you, Dia. Uh, I have uh, exchanged some emails with Dia in the last uh, couple of days. Um, I have put some of the things that we've heard into the format that they have asked for. So I will get that draft over to you guys tonight, so we can start kind of tossing that around, and you can give me your. Feedback, uh, Whitney and I want to have everyone's feedback before we take this, uh, turn this in as a draft form on Friday. Um, I'm just sort of plugging in everything that we're hearing um, and trying to hit the high points um, from the discussions that we've had as a committee. So I will be sending that out tonight and uh, would welcome everybody's feedback and input on that first draft um, before Friday if we can do that. Okay. And we'll check in again um, after our subject matter experts. Is there any business to take up before the SMEs talk to us this evening? Okay, great. I'm really excited to um, introduce retired Minneapolis Police Chief Janae Harto. Uh, she is, I guess, on the left of your screen and retired Colorado State Patrol Lieutenant Colonel Brenda Leffler. Um, they're gonna talk to us about a number of different issues tonight. Um, I think they're gonna both do presentations to us and then we'll open the floor for Q&A. So is, Brenda, are you going first? Mark, are we recording this? Oh, yes, we're recording. Yes, yes. Um, okay. I'll be going first. Okay, do you want me to pull it up or do you want to act as host? Eric, uh, do that. If you can pull it up, that'd be awesome. And then Janae, when we do hers, um, she has her presentation and she'll pull that up. Okay, got it. Okay. 
Everybody, thank you. Uh, we appreciate the audience. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy committee schedule to uh, listen to these presentations. The first thing that uh, I'm going to do is discuss a class called Fair and Impartial Policing, which is a company that I've worked for for about four years. As Margie said, uh, my name is Brenda Leffler. I'm a retired Lieutenant Colonel with the Colorado State Patrol. Um, and I was the equivalent of an assistant chief in Colorado. And my chief that I have was very progressive when it came to implicit bias and procedural justice training. And he brought this company, Fair and Impartial Policing, into the, the state patrol and we trained everyone within my agency from the cadet level, our recruits in the academy, all the way up through uh, the colonel, the chief of the Colorado State Patrol. And Margie, can you go to the next slide? Or do I need to do that? There we go. So Fair and Impartial Policing is the name of the class. It's also the name of the company. It is a company out of the University of South Florida. It's run by a woman named Dr. Lori Friedel. And Dr. Friedel is a criminology professor at the university, and she's considered a subject matter expert in implicit bias, especially when it comes to police officers. And and how police officers interact with community members. Uh, FIP is a sh the shortened term for it. And FIP has been in existence for over 10 years. And we have trained um, agencies for everything from a two-person law enforcement agency all the way up to our latest client that we just got done with uh, earlier this year was the New York City Police Department. Uh, we trained 35,000 NYPD officers from um, the, their patrol officers all the way up to Commissioner O'Neill and his executive staff. We did that over the course of two and a half years, and uh, we're very proud that that was a successful endeavor for us, and we feel like we made great strides and great changes within NYPD. So we've done everything from, like I said, a small two-person department all the way up to the biggest law enforcement agency in this country at the local, state, and national level. Uh, Dr. Friedel is an academic, and um, she, she while well, she's a researcher and an academic and, and a criminology professor, she understands that law enforcement is its own special type of culture, and I'll use special as uh, both good and bad, and we like to be trained by other police officers. So all of our trainers are uh, executives that come from all over the United States, active duty officers, as well as retired uh, law enforcement executives who do the training in the classroom. Next one, please. The unique thing about fair and impartial policing is that everything that we teach is based in science, based in social science, behavioral science, and psychology. Every single word on our slides is backed up by a scientific study. Uh, Dr. Friedel and, and her team of researchers have been very diligent in making sure that what we're teaching is based in science, is not just some uh, theory, academic theory, or, or hypothesis. And that way, uh, it's a really nice way and unemotional, objective way to talk about implicit bias and to a certain degree, explicit bias with both our police officers and our community members. Go ahead, Margie Quinn. FIP at its core is about how the, the human brain works, and that's how we present the class. We talk about the science of how the unconscious um, unconscious biases work, implicit biases work, and the perceptions and actions that can come from those implicit biases. At the end, our, while we are presenting, this is the academic theory and these are the issues, we follow it up with actionable skills that officers, command staff, and community members can take with them back into the real world to do something uh, with the theory that they've been taught. Margie. We know that fair and impartial policing officers and their agencies 
are safe, effective, and just. And that is the mantra that we use as we go throughout our class. We want officers to be safe and be safe and, and make sure that community members are safe. We want them to be effective and objective when handling disorder and, and uh, investigating crimes. And certainly, we want our officers to build community trust whenever they have the opportunity to do so. Good, Margie. We talk about a lot of different implicit biases, that blink response that we all have, the stereotypes that everybody forms as they go through their lives. We focus a lot on race and ethnicity, and we have a lot of scientific studies that discuss race and ethnicity because that is the world that police officers are living in right now with our communities. But we also talk about gender bias and sexual orientation identity. Um, how people look at, at overweight people versus skinny people, um, age at both ends of the spectrum, how we view poor people in this country, what, how we look at handicapped people and undervalue their contribution to society, profession as well as all religions, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that you can stereotype a person on, any category or box you can put a person in, we talk about that in the classroom. Go ahead, Margie. We do have uh, five classes. We have a command and community class that brings law enforcement executives from the department uh, in with community members, mid-managers, which would be lieutenants or captains, uh, sergeants or, and corporals, first-line supervisors, as well as patrol officers and academy recruits. And then we have a train-the-trainer curriculum as well. So those are all separate classes. Go ahead, Margie. The command level class is something that's very interesting and it's about a day and a half and it really looks at the, the entire agency as a whole and the business processes of that agency. And we invite community members in to discuss where the department is and where we want to go ideally with that police department. Go ahead, Margie. We believe in building an action plan in that day and a half for the agency. So Dr. Fridell teaches this, she and her staff will teach it. And in conjunction with community members, we want to make sure that fair and impartial policing and procedural justice is interwoven in every single aspect of the police department from what's trained at the academy to how promotions are being done, assignments are being made, interactions with the community happen on a daily basis. Go ahead, Margie. Here are the components of the uh, comprehensive uh, agency plan. We talk about policies that prohibit bias policing, uh, recruitment, hiring, training, retention. Procedural justice is something that I wanted to touch on. We have entire discussions surrounding procedural justice. In other words, how do officers treat the public with respect, dignity, and fairness and transparency? And then how do officers and command staff and executives treat one another inside their own agency with respect and fairness and empathy and compassion and decency? We need both of those things to be in sync if officers are to go out and, and police in a constitutional manner with empathy and, and courtesy and professionalism. So it's a very valuable block. We talk about leadership, accountability, supervision, how to outreach to different types of communities, um, practices and priorities, where people are staffing, what type of crimes are being focused on and in which neighborhoods specifically to ensure that that's being done in a fair manner. And then we also have a block that looks at data analysis, traffic stop data, uh, so that we understand that we are all analyzing that data in the same manner. Go ahead. When it comes to individual officers, our goal is to give them an orientation, have them do reflection, and be aware of their own behaviors. So reducing the biases that they have and managing the biases that, that they have on the job and off the job. Go ahead, Margie. So when it comes to patrol officers, um, we, we talk about skills. So acknowledging that they're all human beings, that um, people love them, people care for them, and they have the same feelings and actions that any other human walking this earth has. 
um, that, that we want them to be safe. We want them to go home. We want community members to go home. We want them to do a good job and be objective. And we want them to build police legitimacy with the people that they are trying to interact with every single day. We teach them how not to let another citizen or an officer drag them into a bad situation by their own biased actions, um, like the Starbucks incident. We are trying to teach officers how to handle those types of situations. Um, slowing things down, looking at th things through a more objective, unbiased lens, and how to engage with people no matter what the situation in a professional manner. Go ahead, please. First line supervisor takes all those skills, but it also, there you go, Margie. It teaches um, a sergeant or a corporal how to supervise in that situation, to how to recognize implicit bias, um, how to avoid their own biases, gender biases, race bias, um, we, they, in-group, out-group bias, um, and, and how to put that into play. And Margie, one more. Train the Trainer is one of our most popular classes. It takes agency trainers, it takes police department trainers, and over the course of two days, we teach them how to go back to their home agencies and teach the exact same curriculum that the, the national instructors would teach to their to their um, their peers. Um, so instead of us as the staff coming in to train everybody in a department, we can train people within your own agency to go back and train their own fellow officers. Go ahead, Margie. And you have to click through those. So you would be surprised to know that people aren't really excited to come into our classrooms. They, they come in, their arms are folded, they're angry, sometimes they won't talk to us. They're just really defensive and upset and quite frankly, just, just angry about being in a classroom and with a title like this. We work very hard to disarm them, but have really honest conversations about where we are as a country and to talk to them about the honor of being a police officer, but that honor and that responsibility comes with, with you have to be better than, than where we are today as a law enforcement profession. By the time those same officers leave, I will tell you 99% of those officers have a changed perspective. The most um, common uh, uh, comment we get on our evaluations by far is that class wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And from a cop, sometimes that's a win if you can get that out of them. Um, so we're very bold, very bold, very upfront. We hold them accountable. We hold ourselves accountable as trainers. And um, we're trying to make policing a better place for everyone. And I think we've been successful with that. Margie, one more slide. The website FIP fair and impartial policing.com is where all of this class information is. Our COO, her name is Mary Herrig, and she is the one that handles contracts, pricing, classes, everything. And she would be the one um, who could really, if you go forward, she'd be the one you'd be working with and, and could really dive down into what exactly Nashville would need. So that's it for me. That's a the down and dirty overview of fair and impartial policing. And again, I thank you for letting me have that time. Thank you, Brenda. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, do um, uh, Janae's presentation. And then once both are finished, we'll open the floor up for um, for questions for Q&A. So Janae, are you doing your own presentation? I am. I need you to share the screen. Yeah, Brandon, can you switch it over to Janae or to Brenda? Yeah, I signed up. So Jen, hold this up. Can you see my screen? Not yet. 
at the bottom if you see the share button. No, it's not lit. It it's not lit. Oops. No. Nope. Now I passed it to somebody else. To Matt. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> there we go. Okay, but it's still. It opens this. Yeah. Margie, did you get Janae's presentation? I did. You want her to put it up? You can put it up. I don't know if you're able to play the video or not. But it's going to be, there's some things in there that you can't be able to do, however. So I don't, this screen for share is lit up. Do you know what it should it normally be, Madam Chair? I don't. Um, is your, Brenda, uh, Janae, is yours lit up, your share button? No. I can see it, but it's, it's darkened. Everything else is lit up, like stop video and mute. Brandon, can you switch it over to her? It is. She's currently the presenter, but for whatever reason, it's grayed out. I won't let her present. Okay. Do you want to switch it back to me and let me see if I can get her presentation up? In the event the videos don't work, I will make sure that you guys get copies and you can see those later. Looks like it's just gonna take a minute to load. If it's just, um, preface myself with a small intro before you get the, the video up. Um, again, my name is Janae Hartoa. I am a retired police chief. I spent 31 years with the Minneapolis Police Department, the last five years of my career as the police chief. I retired in 2017, and um, I was a very uh, progressive chief. Um, I brought uh, procedural justice, implicit bias, and um, really looking at police legitimacy and moving our profession forward and building the relationships we needed to um, in our communities um, to a whole new level. And I applaud all of you for looking at a variety of initiatives. And as we have conversations about defunding police, I think it's critically important that we talk about funding in the right areas, what makes our officers much more effective. And sometimes it's not, but sometimes it is. And so I, I do think we've taken some steps backwards when we don't have properly funded police departments. We tend to have to go back in time to our old ways and not be as progressive as we once were because what we end up losing first and foremost are all of those initiatives uh, that allow us to build bridges in our communities and to keep people safer and, and be engaged with them and be proactive. And what ends up happening is we, our officers run from call to call and we have little to no time to connect with people and you can't build a relationship in the middle of a crisis, you have to do it ahead of time. Um, when I retired in 2017, I wasn't sure what I wanted to be when I grew up because I'd been in policing for so long. And frankly, if Nashville was looking for a police chief, I might have entertained that. But um, I really wanted to 
um, look at uh, helping the law enforcement profession in a whole new way and on a national way. And I met with some entrepreneurs who are putting together uh, this technology. And if you want to hit the next slide, it's called the Vitals app. Our company is Vitals Aware Services. Um, I started out as an advisor and today I'm the, the president and the CEO of the company. We are Bluetooth technology and we allow people with invisible conditions to communicate with first responders. That could be police, fire, EMS, uh, we're in schools, could be a school teacher. We know that every day in this country, officers are making split second decisions with little or no information, or certainly a lack of information. And although training is key and is very important to what officers do every day, they're missing information. And the Vitals app is a game changer in allowing those vulnerable individuals to communicate directly with officers. If you want to go to the next slide, Madam Chair, and hit the video. Or if you can pause for a second, I just I want to enter, intro the video if I could. Uh, so this is body cam video from Buckeye, Arizona. An officer had been driving around this park and the kid that you'll see him encounter um, was acting suspicious. He had been there for several minutes and they had had some calls at some point in time by um, some of the citizens and residents in the area that there was drug dealing going on. And so we do believe that the officer, when he approached this kid, who you'll find out his name is Connor, uh, was potentially dealing drugs in the park. Not working. It's just advancing the slide. Okay. This may be one of the one of the videos that it looks like it should. Yeah, it does. If you click on the video, does it just advance the slide? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let me describe it to you once we start painting. But I'll describe it to you quickly. So the officer gets out in the car. Um, he he's asked this kid, "What are you doing?" Um, he says, "Not." He actually says he was stimming, but the officer couldn't understand what he was saying. Um, they had a, a very brief encounter, and he asked to see his ID. And as soon as the officer touched Connor, the fight was on. Um, Connor was injured in a takedown. And as what's really important about this video, and I'll send you the link so you can see it, is. You could clearly see that once the officer was had Connor restrained and Connor was talking to him and he was talking to himself and he was trying to calm himself down between the stimming and saying, I'll be okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. He has autism and he was in the park waiting for his mom, but all of his actions seemed very suspicious. His actions were consistent prior to the stop that would uh, make an officer frankly want to stop him but the officer didn't know he was autistic. And we are fairly confident that if this officer had the Vitals app, when he would have rolled up, as soon as he would have got out of the car or even gotten close to Connor, the, the Vitals profile would have came up on his phone and he would have known everything he needed to know about Connor. I'm gonna walk through what that looks like here. So we know uh, one in five U.S. adults have some type of mental health issue. We talk about it every day. We hear a lot about how, you know, officers aren't mental health experts, and I'll be the first person to say we're absolutely not. As a matter of fact, we have our own mental health issues. Um, maybe if we're human, so we do, and we see a lot of things each and every day, and we need to address the welfare, frankly, and mental health of officers. Uh, but it's rising every day, and one in five. We know that encounters with police have more than doubled in the last 10 or so years. A uh, one in 10 response calls for service involves someone with a mental health crisis. And for the Vitals app, it's, it's any type of invisible condition. So it could be PTSD, could be autism, could be dementia, could be Alzheimer's, um, could be some type of med other medical condition, diabetes, and maybe somebody thinks you're intoxicated. So I talked earlier about training officers, but when they don't have that information, sometimes the way a person acts is consistent with somebody who maybe is just uncooperative or being suspicious when in fact they just can't communicate effectively. Uh, so we know there's several people in this country that have um, a disability. So what are people saying? What's the biggest issue? 
our, our parents are caregivers, and there's more and more caregivers every day in this country. People want to become independent. There's not enough housing to, to put people in places, and we want to make sure that they can live happy and safe lives. And our parents, they're worried. They worry all the time that, you know, you see Elijah McLean in Aurora, Colorado. Um, he should be alive today. There's incident after incident where people should be alive, but officers use deadly force because they didn't have the information they needed and they misunderstood what was happening. I'm not taking my hands out of my pockets, so therefore I must be, I have a gun or I'm suspicious in some manner. Um, so our parents and our caregivers are worrying constantly and they don't want their loved ones to get injured. Next slide. Our law enforcement officers saying, look, uh, you know, as a police chief, I entered everybody that came, that started with the police department. I hired all, uh, probably three, 400 people while I was um, with the city as the chief. And every person that gets hired, including myself, the reason why we became police officers is because we want to help people. We want to make um, the world a safer and better place. Um, we don't take this job because we want to harm people or take their lives unnecessarily. And I will tell you that officers that are forced to use deadly force often retire early. It's a conversation we seldom have, but they retire early and it affects who they are as a person. It doesn't stop when you're at work. It impacts you when you go home. So these officers are saying, look, if I only had more information, if I truly understood more about the person in front of me, I would have probably done something different. If in that video in the beginning, if I would have known that Connor had autism, I would have at least treated him differently or, or thought this isn't quite right, but it's not what I thought it was. So we deliver critical information. It increases safety. Um, we have better outcomes with responders because it's a game changer sharing that information. We reduce um, risks and misunderstandings. And uh, I will tell you that we are growing in numbers, not just in law enforcement, but uh, fire and EMS as well. Uh, we are a living, breathing medical alert bracelet, as people like to call it. Next slide. This is the one you, if you can keep hitting the buttons, hopefully it will animate, but I'm not sure. Okay, if we can just, I'll kind of walk through it. Uh, I work for a technology company and the technology is amazing when I'm able to control the buttons. <laughs> um, it's very smooth, but I will just say that what happens is our, um, do you want to just, just stop it there? The, um, the badge on the left and then the kid on the right. Um, we have Alejandro and he has autism. And when he comes within 80 feet of a first responder, the first responder will get a notification on their phone and they'll be able to see the profile. It'll come up and I'll show you what that profile looks like. As soon as the officer leaves, that information does go away. There's no searchable data. We're very protective of the data. Um, it is location-based. So an individual downloads a profile. Generally, it's a caregiver who will create the profile uh, for their loved one. And the first responder will download the first responder app and it's all location based. When they come within 80 feet, it's automatic. It'll go on the first responder's phone. There's no 911 call required. Um, next slide. Um, so I had mentioned briefly um, up in the top there, you see the uh, a person that has the invisible condition. They have a transmitter. Um, it can be in the form of a beacon. I can show you a variety of what those look like. Some of them are dot beacons. They are keychains. Uh, they're uh, like an access card. Uh, you can use your cell phone as a transmitter. Uh, first responder downloads the first responder app. When the two come in contact, basically the transmitter goes up to the secure cloud space, pulls down the person's profile and sends it directly to the first responder's phone. And that's when the first responder will see they have a vitals notification. We also have a, a, a very unique audible alert. In the event the officer isn't in a position to be able to look at their phone, they will be able to know that they have a vitals alert on their phone. And maybe what they're looking at and who they're interacting with is potentially not what, what they initially believe it is. So when they have an opportunity to look at their phone, they can do that. Next slide, Madam Chair. Uh, so here's what the profile looks like. This is what it would look like on an officer's phone. Uh, you have all of the vital information, your name, uh, photograph, all your demographical information, um, your medical information. 
Um, but what's really key on here for me, three things. Uh, first is the behavior triggers, because what might upset one person is highly different than the next person. Uh, what I've learned in doing this in the last three years is if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Um, we're all different. And so, uh, as I've said, training is important, but having specific information about what might trigger an individual is even better. And then we have de-escalation techniques, not your general de-escalation techniques, but what's specific to that person. To a child, it might be a particular, they want to be called Joe, even though their name is Joseph, or maybe they want to be called something totally different. Uh, but those de-escalation techniques are very specific to them. And um, they can put as much or, or little information in there uh, that will be most helpful. We can also embed videos. We've had kids who uh, really calm down when they see uh, the little mermaid or some type of video that's really helpful to them. And then um, the third thing is on the bottom uh, is caregiver information. So uh, as, an, uh, as an officer, I can't count how many times uh, we'd find a elderly person wandering around. We don't know their name. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they live. And we spend a really long time trying to figure it out and we end up taking them to the hospital. And we could just get the caregiver information. We could immediately dial their number and find out, you know, oh, we have Joe here and this is, I have his wife's number or his daughter's number. And so we're saving time and we're having more effective results. It's not just what we do, it's how we do it. Next, please. Uh, we have some additional safety features for um, caregivers as well, uh, wandering alerts. So as soon as uh, you can, as soon as somebody leaves, so I mentioned the 80 feet, and I don't want to get too complicated about it because it's really once you download it, you never have to think about it, frankly. Uh, but it activates as soon as somebody leaves and they're out of range 80 feet, you'll get a wandering alert notification. And it'll say your son, your dad, whoever is out of range. And you can immediately start to activate the search. So we are launching full GPS on this. Uh, in the event something happens and you um, you didn't get the notification, you missed the notification, your loved one is already missing, that's when the profile also is very important to a first responder who may not know that this person is missing, but you can put in the profile that they're gone, that they're a runaway, they're missing, they've wandered, and you can continue to update information in the profile. It's very simple to do. It's simple to update um, medical information. or Things that are important that you don't get to do with a medical alert bracelet, um, I have diabetes, but maybe I haven't taken medication for the last couple of days. Maybe I've had severe headaches. Um, maybe I've, I haven't eaten and or I'm dehydrated, but different things that my caregiver could, or myself, if I wanted people to, to understand, because we have plenty of um, caregivers for themselves that create profiles because they're adults with autism, or even those that we've had a gentleman that had severe PTSD, and when he's in the right frame of mind, he created a profile, and as a matter of fact, the officers came to his house one night because he was uh, very despondent and suicidal, and he put a beacon in his truck and went at the front door, and the officers had uh, their participate um, with vitals, and as soon as they got to his home, they knew how to de-escalate him, and he's convinced that the officers saved his life that night because he would have done suicide by cop. He was very distraught, but they knew to talk about his kids. They knew his kids' names. They knew everything they needed to know in that moment to, to keep him safe. Next, please. Uh, we also have geofencing, which means we you can create a, a basically a safety fence. We know that um, people with dementia are often attracted to water, and um, you can create a, a boundary, a geofence around particular bodies of water, maybe around your house, or maybe there's an area that you know that is dangerous that your son or daughter or, or whoever you're caring for tends to go to. And, and so now you're not only gonna get a notice when somebody exits and they're outside your geofence, you're gonna know if they enter into an area you deem unsafe. Next. Now, I don't know if this, this probably won't work either, but this picture on here um, is actually a video that's embedded into the, the profile app. And when an officer opens up their phone, they will see mom's voice and they can click the button and they will see this mom who gives a real quick message to her son and basically says, uh, the people that are there with you are there to keep you safe. 
and I will be with you soon. And it's just really quick so that they understand and her son understands, his name is Caleb and I think he's on the next slide, um, that the officers are there to keep them safe. So if there's one profile that pops up, you'll see a small uh, photo like that and you can open it up. Um, you could have multiple profiles. Let's say you're at a, um, a, a ball game or some type of event where there's a, you know, a state fair, a large event, or frankly, even in a school where there's a significant numbers of people, you can look on there and, and identify maybe who you want to look at. Because this is not 911 driven, it's location based. The, the value really comes in, oftentimes officers find themselves with somebody in front of them that are suspicious and is frankly not a 911 call. They know nothing. They know that somebody seems to be off, they're acting strange, whatever it is. Um, this vitals alert will give them the information before they even know they need it. And uh, for me as a, you know, an urban chief, always looking for ways for, for my officers to connect with the communities outside of a crisis, I looked at it also as a digital introduction. Sometimes just knowing somebody's name is an absolute game changer. It can, it really can change the outcome. And just because you get a vitals alert doesn't mean you have to take action. Or maybe you just wanna introduce yourself and say, hi, I'm officer so-and-so. Uh, Brian and I, you know, I, I see you. You're have a vitals app. I mean, that's a that's a starter. We have a lot of departments and officers who have, have done that and have those encounters. Um, so it's a, it's proactive as much as it, it can be um, reactive. Next, please. And that's a great video too. I'll make sure you get. So what could have been a really fabulous presentation <laughs> became a 1975 rendition of a technology company. Um, but I would love to be able to get you the videos, um, have you be able to see it in action. Uh, it is truly a game changer and we've already saved lives. And with that, Madam Chair, Great, thank you. Uh, that was fantastic. And so I'd love to open it up on the floor for questions for Brenda or Janae on the topics of fair and impartial policing. Um, I did also ask Janae to kind of touch on uh, the challenges of creating cultural change within a metropolitan police department. I think she's an excellent person to talk about that. Um, or uh, Vitals app and how that's changing the, the nature of policing. So go ahead, Demetria. Thank you, Madam Chair. I didn't expect to go first. I'm fascinated about Vitals. Um, has it been court ordered in any cases? And uh, what's the cost? It, it has not been court ordered. Um, we are in conversations right now. It's truly about people volunteering their information. There's so many people out there who want to share their information. Uh, we are, will be announcing also a, um, a partnership that we have with a company that is also connected to 85% of all 911 centers in the country. And so if your phone number, if you dial your phone number and you have a 911 call, they'll automatically look to see if you have a vitals profile or if one of your loved ones, if you generate one through that, that phone call. Um, for individuals, right now it is a 30-day free trial to create a, a caregiver or a profile app, and then it is $4.99 a month, $4.99. I had somebody ask me if it was $499. I'm like, no, it's $4.99 a month. Uh, for police departments, it is basically a licensing fee, and it's generally dependent upon the size of the department. We usually, um, two things, I do like to uh, vet departments and cities to make sure that they're a good fit and they're set up for success and have a fairly robust uh, relationship with their mental health providers and social services, because this is something that we have found when we onboard cities collectively with those partners, we have greater success. Um, and that's, like I said, dependent upon size of department. And then of course, Nashville, you would be the first in Tennessee we don't have any law enforcement agencies in Tennessee, so that would be something that we, um, we would want to talk about as well. Um, and the first major city. So you're in competition with Aurora, Colorado right now to be the first major city chief or police department. 
Madam Chair, this is Gary Moore, and I don't can't raise my hand. So when you have see an opportunity, I appreciate you recognizing me. Uh, that's great, Gary. Go ahead. You're up. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I actually have four questions. I hate to throw that many questions at you, and I'm we'll open it up to either one of you. But I guess my first question is we're going back to the, the New York uh, Police Department. Can you share your their action plan? Y'all create an action plan once you do the teaching. Of course, Nashville would be different, so I don't want you to share the whole plan. But if you would point out some specific changes that y'all recommended to that the New York Police Department make, that would be helpful to us, I think. So what were some of those um, changes that y'all recommended in your action plan? Uh, again, you can get that information to the chair. If she can share it with us. And my follow-up question on a different subject here is, how does a person getting into this system, an, an autistic person, I think uh, you answered Demetrius' question, and it's, it's, it's voluntarily, but to my knowledge, I certainly wasn't aware of it until I heard this today. So it's not very well put out there for the public to know that they even have an opportunity to get in. Are y'all going to be addressing that in the future in any way? Do you want me to start? Sure. Um, so what we do is we, when we onboard a police department, we also work closely with the city to ensure that those that need it sign up. We have um, partners uh, with the Autistic Society, uh, National Dementia Organizations, uh, NASDA, which is the National Association of um, Adult Daycare Centers. And so we're working with all of those entities and we have many individuals that are signed up that are uh, in which police departments frankly aren't even signed up yet but we try to do those together and um, we have a whole onboarding process and we do a lot of media and we do a lot of outreach to ensure that we get people signed up and frankly we're we're a fairly young company so we're working diligently to ensure that we get as much press and marketing as we can so that people know this is available um, we're in over 70 police departments. Uh, we're in um, Minnesota, California. We just launched in France and Missouri. Uh, you know, they have eight to nine million visitors every year and they're very concerned about them. So we're working on a separate program for them for people that come in to visit. Uh, we're smattered across the country right now in, in a variety of areas. Okay, one follow-up question and then I'll, I'll turn it over to somebody else. But uh, once you move into the city, let's say that uh, Nashville uh, contracts with y'all to provide this service to the uh, police department. Is it also available to fire, fire and EMS? Yes, and as a matter of fact, we, we encourage people to sign up uh, at the same time. Uh, depending on the size of counties, we've had counties sign up and the sheriff has led the initiative and all the police chiefs within that county have signed up at the same time, along with the uh, fire and EMS. Uh, sometimes we have volunteer fire, so that's a little bit different, but we, we do, we really look to you guys to identify key stakeholders and we do a lot of meetings and outreach with you to ensure that we get get the right people on and signed up at the same time. Uh, Brenda, would you give us a little flavor of what a recommendation might look like for a police department to answer Gary's first question? Um, so Gary, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, NYPD 35,000 people, one of the biggest issues that we found, and we find this even in smaller agencies is consistency across the board with, uh, how they will look how a, a officer looks at a policy versus how a supervisor interprets a policy. So just because a police chief writes something down on a piece of paper, doesn't necessarily mean that that's how that, that. Uh, it seems the policy is being carried out in reality. And so we had a lot of conversations about stopping people based on just what they look like, um, which we know they can't do. It's illegal. They've, they've gone through stop and frisk um, issues extensively within N NYPD and, and all of the boroughs. Um, so that was one recommendation that we were able to put forth that really tried to to flatten the board for everyone, get everybody on the same page so that when you've got a rookie cop who goes out at two o'clock in the morning, he knows or she knows exactly what they can do based on that uh, anti-bias policing policy. So that was one of the best things I think we did in the city. Thank you. Sabina, did you have a question? 
Hi, um, thank you both for um, explaining the work that you're doing. And this question was for Brenda. Um, so you, I think you've said you've been in business for 10 years. And so do you have any data to show that after you've done the training, you've left, that you've seen a change in the department. And um, also, um, it, it sounds like you come in one time and you do these trainings with different groups of officers. Um, but how often are trainings happening after you leave? So you do the train the trainers, and, and how often do you recommend this kind of training is done? Great, great questions. Um, the, I'll start with the last one first. We we will come in and, and um, we will we'll train everybody. And we recommend that people have a booster training within three years um, as far as the department goes. A lot of departments have a mandate or recommendation that they'll do some form of implicit bias training or procedural justice training every single year. And we have booster training and in-service training that goes along with the main curriculum. So as long as your, your agency's been trained in, in the main curriculum, um, then we can follow on with additional training in the number of years, however the department wants to set that schedule. Uh, for the train the trainers, we require them to recertify every three years with us. So it's not um, like they can just have the training and then they're good for the rest of their career. Um, our, and we are um, copyrighted. And so they are authorized to train their own department and only their own department at that level. We're always updating the curriculum as well. So as we get new scientific studies, um, we push that information out to our trainers. Uh, we have a learning management system, an LMS system, where we are in contact with all of our trainers at the local level. So that if there's an update that comes out, a new PowerPoint presentation, a new study, they get that information along with the national trainers. And then as far as I've you know, seen changes in the departments, I, I will be honest, a lot of that is anecdotal. You know, a lot of it is, is when you see an officer who comes in and they'll say, I don't have bias, I, I've never had bias, I've never seen bias. And then by the end of the class, they say, I recognize myself in your examples. I recognize what I've done in some of those videos. And that person will say, you know, I wish I'd had this 20 years ago. It would have helped me as an officer. The one data that we do have is with NYPD, uh, a study was done, an academic study was done to look at the attitudes of the NYPD officers before they came into the class and then how they felt after the class and did they change anything. And that, I mean, it's self-reported data. So you have to look at it from that perspective as a limitation of the data. Uh, but we found that we did alter a, a considerable number of people within NYPD and change how they do their job on a daily basis. Sabina, did you have anything else? Uh, mm, not at this moment, thank you. Okay. Uh, David, go ahead. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, question, Brenda, about the implicit bias training. I was curious, does this process bring to the surface any individuals who um, essentially have unshakable bias and are therefore not suited to being police officers? You want the politically correct answer to that? Or <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> um, I, I think that a lot of times people come in and they are defensive. Um, and especially from a police officer's perspective, you know, we would see students who would come in and they would just be arms crossed and scowling and just and just so angry about their perception of how the community feels about them or their perception about their place as a police officer right now. Um, and we would work with those officers individually. And I think, you know, I will say out of 10 students, 
nine of those I was able to say, you know, look at this perspective or look at from that perspective. Uh, but there are definitely officers within the country. I'm not going to say they shouldn't be police officers, but they do feel persecuted by their communities. They do feel like they can't do anything as a police officer anymore without it being Monday morning quarterbacked um, or criticized. And so they are, a lot of times they're in a very defensive posture when they first come into the room. Okay, thank you. Mr. Harris, did you have a question? I saw your, your digital hand up. I think David got to the root of my question, so I'll, I'll yield the floor. Okay, go ahead, Whitney. Hey, um, thank you both uh, for speaking. Um, this is directed towards uh, Janae. Um, you know, hearing about your abs, I definitely, uh, it brought out some concerns around privacy and um, also concerns about if this could actually be used to justify harm against people with disabilities. So I'm wondering um, what input have you had from people with disabilities um, and advocates like from that community and the disability justice community? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, we started out with focus groups and this really was um, a working and build out initiative actually with uh, Autism Society of Minnesota and uh, parents and the police department. Police came in later and the app was really developed based on what um, our caregivers, what groups um, that we worked with, um, Awesome, uh, what they really felt would help. Um, this, one of the reasons why we ensure that the data is not searchable is so the, uh, and it's appreciated the most by the community, it's driven by the community because they get to control the data. They get to control the story. I don't want somebody saying and creating my narrative. I want to talk about my children. I want you to know what my condition is, my son's is, and get to know that person and, and not just do it based on stereotypes or what you believe others to, um, to act like or be like. Um, we have not had any any issues as of yet. We um, ensure that we, you know, train our officers so they understand what the app is. What you didn't get to see in the video is the officers will the profile will pop up on their screen when they're within 80 feet, but when that person goes away, so too does the profile. So there's no searchable data. The, all the information that goes in there is what the caregiver chooses to put in there. We do. Uh, make sure we have parameters and things in there, what we'd like them to put in there, you know, name, birth date, those types of things, those types of guidelines. But we don't even have the drop down boxes for um, the behavior triggers or anything because we want it very, very specific to the individuals. But we are constantly improving and working on the profile itself and how this looks and the wandering alerts and all those things are driven by those uh, entities, not by police, it's the other way around. Thank you. I guess I, I do want to push back um, and clarify, you know, you mentioned getting feedback from the caregivers, but what about like the people with disabilities? Um, have you heard feedback from those individuals? Yes, yeah, so there, it'd be the same as caregivers. So some people are, you know, like an adult with autism. One of our greatest spokesperson was one of our uh, initial carriers uh, of the profile app. Um, is Jillian and she she has autism and uh, she talked about her experiences and as a matter of fact the police department hadn't had it yet um, so they didn't get the profile on their phone but she was actually able to show them her phone with her profile on it so they understood that she was having an episode because they didn't have the clothes that she was looking for in the mall when she was there um, but we pride ourselves on the input from our vulnerable individual and their caregivers. This is all about the vulnerable individual as a center. We want to keep them safe wherever they go. And that's why we're in schools. You go to school, you go to work, you go on vacation. We're looking at destination locations and ensuring that anybody that's caring for that person has the information they need. It's generally information that you want somebody to have 
because you, you're going to need it in a time of crisis, or you're going to you're going to want officers to understand that you have a condition or you have a situation. Now, on the flip side, I'll have officers say the same thing. Well, who's to say somebody doesn't create a profile to try to get out of something? Well, officers should be taking action based on was a crime committed? If somebody had done something, you know, you need to take those actions. If if somebody has a, a condition, uh, any type of um, invisible condition, that doesn't mean that you don't respond to whatever their actions are. We have feedbacks in our profile to allow officers to say this worked or this didn't work so we can notify caregivers that maybe this time uh, talking to Jimmy in this particular way or showing the video didn't work. Uh, but all the information is controlled by our caregivers or the individuals themselves. Uh, Mr. Harris. So it's nobody's, nobody's making anybody do it. These folks all want, want to participate in the program. Great. Mr. Harris, did you have your hand back up? Yes, I did. Um, Brenda, this is for you. Uh, you mentioned that the implicit bias training is based in science, brain work. Do you have any case studies you know, that you can share you know, with us? Any kind of case studies? Oh, uh, I have, yes, we, uh, we've got extensive bibliographies, extensive references. Um, I'm happy to send those to Margie and she can send them to all of you. Um, I, it's, it's hundreds of um, scientific studies going back into the 1970s. Some of them even uh, the Dull study, we referenced that, the Dr. Mamie Clark and her husband, the, um, the 1940s, 1950s Dull studies. Um, so one of the, the key components of the class is to show students that this is not something that is recent. Um, this is something that, is, that has been happening since the beginning of human beings. And so we go back as far as we can with those scientific studies, but I'm happy to share the, uh, the references. That would be great. I'm a, okay. I'm a big geek anyway, so. Okay, I will get those to Madam Chairwoman. Okay, anybody, anybody else have questions? Uh, go ahead, Sabina. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask, um, the question is like going out of my head at the moment, but uh, yeah, when you do trainings for a police department, do you go back and look at what policy that the department has already in the books and customize your training for that department? No, yes and no. So we, we look specifically at their bias policing policy and there are a, there are different types of policies. Uh, we have mod, what we call model policies. So we have two types of model policies um, depending on um, how the department wants to go forward uh, with their enforcement strategies. And then we help chiefs of police and their executive staff build their own policies off of the national standards. Thanks. Demetria. I'm just wondering, I'm not, I'm not a technical geek and I don't know how many G's it takes to uh, control vitals, but have there been any um, connectivity problems or terrain problems or places where it just won't work? Uh, we're like any other Bluetooth service, so um, it's going to work most of the time. I can't say 100%. Absolutely, I couldn't say that. Um, but we've had very little issues with it, but it's, it's like any other Bluetooth technology. Okay, any other, any questions? I've got a couple of questions. Um, Brenda, I would love for you to talk about, um, you talked a little bit about the implicit bias as it relates to internal, like hiring, promotions, um, the way the, the, the internal structure is working. And if you could address that and maybe talk about how 
the training would uh, would either change that or address that because one of the buckets that this committee has is um, MNPD culture. And okay. so I would love for you to talk about that for a minute. Okay, so the per probably the procedural justice uh, section and then when we're talking about first line supervisors all the way up to the chief of police, when we're talking about what is the culture of your agency internally? We know that the expectations that we have of police departments facing outward with our communities, we, we all can agree on essentially what that should look like, that we should be providing you know, fair treatment, impartial treatment, um, just treatment, empathetic treatment to our communities, regardless of their socioeconomic status, their racial status, their their gender, their, their sexual orientation. We're, we're pretty good as law enforcement agencies at defining what we want that to look like. Where we struggle, quite frankly, is what the culture inside the agency sometimes looks like and sometimes what it evolves into, either because of specific actions or sometimes because of non-actions on the part of leadership. Um, and so when we talk about procedural justice, we're, we're talking about what are, the, what are the biases that a supervisor, and I'm talking from a sergeant or a corporal level, a first line supervisor, all the way up to a chief of police, what are those internal biases that they have individually that when they go to work and they're making personnel decisions, hiring decisions, um, transfer decisions, specialty assignment decisions, what are they, are those implicit biases influencing that decision-making process? And so we really have very candid conversations with leadership about, you know, if you are only um, sending men to SWAT school, Maybe even unknowingly, you're reinforcing gender bias. Or if you're only sending the women to a, a, a policy writing class, you're reinforcing gender bias in a different direction. If you are instructing officers, you know, to to have an administrative or a, an operational decision that they're going to go and they're going to go to this neighborhood every single night because it's easy to go uh, pick up crimes there. Why are you doing that? Is there a public safety issue that's happening that's necessitating that? Or are you going there because you're just making lazy supervisory decisions in your community? Um, are you assigning your gay and lesbian officers to go to the pride parade because they should magically be able to associate with that group of people. And so we, we, we talk about all those decisions um, that we make inside a, an agency that little decisions, especially in the course of an officer's career over time, really can add up to the trajectory of, of an officer's career, either being taken to a good place or to a bad place. Um, and Janae tells a story all the time about, you know, the. The guys who played hockey with one of the police chiefs in Minneapolis, they were the favorite sons. And so they, you know, they they had influence, informal influence over the chief of police. So again, candid, very deliberate um, conversations about the implication of making decisions based on your own internal biases and how that impacts the culture of the agency, especially over time. Great, that's perfect. I, I know the three of us have had conversations over the years about it's it's as a woman in law enforcement, it's not hard to get one of the girl jobs, um, and there are certainly girl jobs um, within with any police department, um, but they are they can be dead endish type of jobs, and they can be career defining. Yep, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and it's little. Um, so that's that's very helpful. And then my other question, Janae, is for you, and it's um, a separate and apart from the Vitals app. I wanted to hear you talk about the challenges of um, changing culture um, just from the chief's position. 
Um, you know, Nashville has an opportunity to hire a new chief, but that's not going to be a magic bullet. Um, and I, I would love to hear you talk about the challenges um, from the chief's perspective um, in creating that cultural change, where it starts, where it goes, and kind of what the barriers are to that. Uh, well, first you have to back up. Um, culture is already created in organizations and for mine it had been created over 150 years. And so um, you really have to have not just the chief's vision, but all of you have an opportunity to say, what should the National Police Department look like? What is it that we want our officers to do? And once you start to re, and I love the reimagine conversation, frankly, because that's really what I was trying to do. Um, is look at how we could be most effective. What do we need to do that? Who should we be hiring? Um, if we want to not be hiring all white Neanderthal men, then, then we probably should change our testing processes. And even as we start to promote people, just because you're uh, really good at answering 911 calls doesn't make you a uh, a good supervisor and you can lead people. So uh, if we want more women, we have to have recruiting strategies. If we want to have people of color, we have to have recruiting strategies and building relationships in, in communities um, where there's people of color. Uh, so the opportunity begins with really saying what we want this to look like. And I believe in vitals. I brought implicit bias to, to my department too, but it has to be a part of a larger strategy. Neither one of these things are gonna fix everything in and of themselves. You have to have a chief and a, and a mayor who, or a city manager, whoever is leading the, the city and saying, this is what we want our police officers to do. We, I didn't want my cops to be frankly report writers or just uh, this wasn't a drive through service. I wanted you to take your time on calls um, because we know that most of the time an individual maybe call the police once or twice in their lifetime. I expect you to give them service and to be able to do things outside of 911 calls, which means we have to have more cops on foot, on beat. Well, guess what? When you have more officers out of the car, your response times are gonna go down. So then what happened to me, I'd get people out on foot and they'd be connecting the community and then I'd get yelled at because the response times went down. So you have to be um, really honest with how many resources you need to manage calls for service, and balance those with calls that are important and interactions that are important that are not reflective in 911 calls. You can't just measure arrests because what gets measured gets done. And if we're only looking at arrests and we're not looking at outcomes and we're not looking at connections and we're not tracking those, then you're only gonna get arrests. And so moving into 21st century policing and changing culture starts from the beginning. You guys have a real opportunity to do that. You have a new person in charge. I knew your prior chief, great guy, but he was there a long time. And so that culture is there. You can change it with an internal candidate or you can change it with an external, but there has to be a plan, a bigger plan. Mine was procedural justice. And I called, you know, my tenure was all about MPD 2.0. We were trying to create a culture of accountability and you have to hire right, but you have to have effective discipline processes. You have to have timely discipline. You can't, you know, tell somebody two years from now that they're in trouble because of something they did two years ago. It's not effective and doesn't work. We need early warning systems, early interventions, so we can track a, a person's progress and um, I mentioned it in the vitals presentation officers have mental health issues um, they, they experience cradle tenants and I'm sorry about the dogs and we have to address those because and we know that when officers start to use force oftentimes it's because they've been involved in critical incidents mm -hmm. and those are things we need to be monitoring and looking at but it has to be a balance of support training education and resources it can't just be discipline, accountability, right? It, you have to have all of those things. We need to support the things that we want to see more of. We need to have resources in places that we know are gonna have the benefit we want so we can prevent crime, so we can build relationships. I mean, that's one of the things I love about Vitals is we know that we need mental health uh, I did a co-responder program in Minneapolis. We needed mental health workers to go out with our police officers. There's not enough out there. This is a way for an officer to at least have a digital health, digital mental health co-responder in their pocket. 
it's something. If we can save a life, if we can prevent uses of force, if we can have more positive interactions, then that's what we want to do. Uh, but it's really a part of a larger strategy. I'm happy to talk to anybody about it. It's pretty, you know, mine was fairly um, in depth and you have to take pieces of it. You have to adjust things internally and externally. Um, it is really a truly a combination, but you have a real opportunity right now to, to really change what things look like, but you have to first say, this is what we want it to look like, and then have who is ever in charge be honest with you to say, this is how we get it done. And you have to strike that balance. Thank you. Um, Reggie, I think brought up a great point last week. Um, he's part of our committee here and um, his point was if you, you know, if you're going to make a promotion um, and he likened it to marbles in the bag, if all the marbles are, are white marbles and there, there's only one, there are 30 white marbles, one black marble, maybe two pink marbles, you know, the, the opportunity to promote uh, you know, persons, you know, minority persons. And I know women are not typically minorities within the population, but they are very much a minority within police departments. Now, that's because of the lack of developing people. So my, I, I promoted more women and more people of color than anybody in, in, in the history of the department. Qualified. Qualified people. Because what I did is if I had two people that were qualified, the same, the woman and the person of color got it every time. And I will make no apologies for that because before it was my buddy or the other white guy that got it. So every one of them have been successful. They've gone on to be police chiefs elsewhere. They've done a phenomenal job, but we've got to stop the cycle somewhere. And the best way to do it is to when you, it's, it's the tie. If they're not qualified, that's different, but then it's also on us to make sure. I, ha I brought a consultant in and we really created a, a, a talent review process so that we would prepare people before they got to those positions. And if we did readiness assessments, if that person is not ready to be promoted, why not? Do they need new experiences? Do they need um, education and training? Then it's our job to make sure they get those that training. We can't just say, oh, well, I'm sorry, we only have one woman. I mean, I knew I was competing against only other women. I, I, I became the first female chief, not because I was the only one qualified. Um, it's because they were finally ready for one. And at that time, I was the highest ranking female um, in that department. Um, but it's it was about timing. But I'll just go back to you guys have a real opportunity. And it seems like you got a lot of the right people at the table. And now with the whole conversation about reinvention and, and reform, you know, reform has always been a conversation. But if we don't start, we have technology, we need to collect the data. I started looking at stops and why people were being stopped, but first you have to collect it, then you have to analyze it, then you have to look for any issues that might be there, and then you have to address those issues and figure out what they are. But everything begins with awareness. Implicit bias begins with awareness. If we're stopping people of color or we're always in neighborhoods where um, people have um, low socioeconomic status or it's always people of color, we have to understand why that is, but we have to analyze it and look at it and then assess it. But it starts with at least collecting the data and being aware of it. So I just wanted to follow up on one little thing you said, which was uh, mental health within the policing community and how that can manifest itself um, in the way they treat people or calls. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you um, what you sort of conceived uh, as sort of an early warning system um, and what's maybe is appropriate with regards to the mental health of police officers? Well, part of the early warning can be uh, connected to that um, mental, well, I would just call it officer health and wellness training. So we, we, um, Brought in Russ Mike and talk about that too. Um, and um, we, we started to educate our supervisors on what to look for in individuals because if somebody had maybe been involved in a critical incident and we assume, you know, 
So it's the usual. When officers involved in the shooting, they get three days off, and now they're supposed to, you know, they give their statements, and they're supposed to go to the city doctor, and they have a, a mental health assessment, and we put them back on the street. Where does magic three days come from? We don't just all of a sudden become good in three days. Maybe three months from now, I'm going to have an issue. Nobody's even thinking about me three months from now. Nobody's thinking about me on the anniversary of this shooting. Nobody's thinking about the things that I'm probably going through, not just at work, but now I'm going through a divorce or my parents are, I have to care for my, my dad with dementia. And I have all these things going on. You know, I have these critical incidents and things I've experienced on the job. And then I overlay that with what's happening in my personal life. And so really having a robust mental health component for officers is important. Having an effective discipline process is also as important. One of the things that I wasn't able to do because I had a really strong union who fought me every step of the way and I had automatic arbitration and anybody I fired got arbitration and 99% of the time they got their jobs back because the arbitrator you know, split it in half and say you get two weeks off and therefore you get disciplined but you get to keep your job. No, that's not how that should work. Um, I just had a senior second moment here. Um, but I think the belt for the officer's behavior and their attitudes towards the public are those lower level um, attitudes, right? You get the uh, complaint that somebody says, uh, the uh, officer was verbally abusive or they had a really bad attitude, they're really negative. That always is a low threshold in the police department. It's like looked at as sometimes it's just uh, a coaching. It's not even considered discipline if you get in trouble for that. And for me, that really is an indicator of how that officer views the public, how that officer is doing mentally and what's going on. And I wanted to increase the level of discipline for that. I didn't want it to be the lowest level. I thought it was too important. And that's the number one complaint in any police department across this country, guaranteed, is attitude and language. Those two things. That's the bellwether right there. That'll tell you how your department's doing, what the mindset is, what's the attitude. Are they saying, you know, we'll call the mayor. We don't have enough cops. I can't do anything for you. Or just being verbally abusive. I mean, I fired cops for racial slurs, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those, you know, just attitudinal, uh, I think of you as less than, and I don't quite cross the line of being vulgar or racial slurs, but up to, so you know exactly that I look at you at the bottom of the, you know, you're at the bottom in, in my view. So um, you guys, not, you're a right to work state, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I think if I think you can read every part of the discipline, um, you know, it was really, it just hard to change. Union folks and the union president have been in the union for 24 years. And outside of Nashville and a couple other places, the lifespan of a police chief is generally three to six years in a major city. It's not long. And so the person that really, you know, had the most influence over culture in, in my city was the union. It was really hard to constantly fight the union. And they're part of the Ferguson effect and war on cops and this whole attitude of, you know, everybody's against us. And the only person that supports me is the union because the chief's gonna hold me accountable and fire me. Yes, I am if you don't do your job because, you know, that's, I got uh, everybody else that I, I need to uh, be responsible to. Thank you. Sabina, did you have another question? I did, but uh, thank you, Janae, for sharing all that. I, I think we could spend the whole, you know, another hour listening to your experience, but while you're here on the call, I would love to know, because I know there's a large uh, Somali population in Minneapolis, and how are you able to recruit or build um, trust within that community? And just trying to understand because we've talked a lot about hiring and recruitment. Yep. We had a we made a concerted effort to recruit Somali officers and we created community engagement teams in our um, highest concentration of areas where us Somali folks live. And um, we were able to recruit and then once we were able to hire, I think we had the first Somali officer in the country. Ohio might have beat us, but I know we had the first sergeant. He's fabulous. I He's, he's actually a good friend of mine. And, and so we also worked with uh, 
the Police Executive Research Forum, PERF, and did um, a lot of work on procedural justice in the areas where folks live. Because this, this whole idea of calling police, how domestics are viewed, you know, it's really was, it was an education for all the officers. So officers could understand that maybe if, if you're doing a traffic stop, the reaction of uh, a Somali male in that car, how they're going to feel if you walk up onto the car, if you ask them to come out of the car. Um, it was just really an education on both sides. And, and it just really began with that. But we, we had community engagement teams that uh, consistently went out and were in, in different areas. And we had um, people very reflective in, in each of those teams. Thank you. And we use radio a lot because Somali, you can't do everything on TV or in traditional recruiting ways. They were very um, in tune to the radio all the time. And so even as chief, I would go on uh, the Somali radio stations to communicate um, with them so that they knew and could hear from me directly because you, you wouldn't do it in traditional ways. So we had to change some of our ways and add and how we communicated. Great, thank you, Sabina. Um, do we have any other questions? And Gary, on the phone, have you got any further? No, ma'am, thank you. Okay, going once, any further questions? Okay, uh, I wanna thank um, on behalf of the committee, uh, Brenda and Janae for spending this hour plus with us. Um, I know that you're going to be sending me some information that I can get out, uh, but I think uh, your experience is uh, tremendous and, and it's been invaluable to hear you talk um, from your perspectives. Um, and I hope that it will impact uh, some of the recommendations that we make um, as we search for a police chief. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll make sure that some links videos so that you guys can have those and take a look at those. And then if you have any additional questions, feel free to ask. Yep. Thank you. For me too. All right. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I hope that that was valuable. Um, I know they're both from different areas, but I think their um, experience certainly translates. So next up, I would love to hear from Daryl and Dia. Um, what's the latest on the data committee? I think we'll let Dia lead off as usual. <laughs> That's very kind of you, Daryl. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate that, but I think Daryl adds a great deal to the discussion in the data committee. Um, it brings a lot of expertise and experience, um, and it, it helps us to focus. So um, in last week's committee, and Daryl will keep me honest, um, we um, took a look at uh, the community surveys that have been conducted because we were very interested in trying to get at issues of confidence and perhaps issues of trust. Um, there are some good things in those community surveys. I'm not gonna get into the, the, the data depths of the surveys, um, but you know, I think we did walk away with the fact that there's an opportunity also to enhance them. Uh, you know, I think the where the data stand right now they don't really lend to much insight in the kinds of issues we've been talking about. Um, so one op opportunity there is really, you know, as we head into the planning session on the 14th is to really think about what kind of surveys would be uh, helpful and instructive and how can they build on some of the information that um, MNPD currently has through their surveys. Um, so, so that might be something for the planning day to consider. On another note, um, we did have a chance to look at the age distribution within the force. And um, I do have it um, you know, up and I can show you what that looks like. And you know, Daryl, if you wanna narrate it um, you know, or jump in with me and, and just sort of talk a little bit about what we're seeing, um, I can tell I've been made the presenter and I can see that I can share. 
So the question is, aha, uh -huh, here we go. Uh, and let me make it a little bigger. Okay, so we'll close this. So we're very fortunate because Dr. Peter Valier from MNCO did the data cut for us. And um, so here's the first look. Daryl, I invite you to jump in at any time. This probably is the least sexy cut. I mean, I think it's what we would all anticipate seeing, and, and this is evidencing that, you know, we have median age of about 35, and at least I'm not surprised by this. Okay. But I think what is an important takeaway that Peter actually spoke to is, is that you've got sort of half and half distribution um, in terms of, you know, where the force really sits on the age spectrum. I think that's shown really well in terms of when you review the median, you're looking at standard deviation and it's not a high number, which means we don't have a lot of outliers. There's a lot of compaction toward the middle. Um, also, when you look through the demographic breakdown, it's as we anticipated and as other data sources have led us to believe, um, again, as expected. So, and if I may, I think um, Peter Valier also mentioned um, from this analysis, there are a couple of things that do jump out. So for example, um, black Americans in the force um, are have a higher average age and a, a larger spread uh, standard deviation. Um, and so, um, Peter said from a statistical standpoint, this looks a little bit like a retention issue. Um, since we know that we have folks who come in at 22 and, and folks who are aging out at 68. Um, so that's one thing to take a look at, um, certainly. And then um, the other really interesting um, items that Peter flagged really looked at um, when we look at the Latino population within the force, they have one of the lowest um, average ages. Uh, so it means there are folks who are coming in. Um, and this is true with women. We can see that women tend to be on the young side. Um, so that does mean that women are coming in. Um, and it does mean that Latinos are coming in. And so I think these are things that are, are good to take a look at and think about in terms of your recommendations. I think it also signals um, I think probably primarily in the black analysis more than anything that there might have been a period of gap where we weren't actively seeking that population and and it's all sort of turning back on again now and you're starting to see I mean Nashville's demographic is shifting somewhat with the Latino population as it grows um, over the last decade anyway so I think you're starting to see that UMPD has been um, very deliberate and intentional in more recent days or years in terms of attraction in the black community, Hispanic community, and the female um, gender group. But there seems to be this one big gap that at least we're starting to address it, but I'm not sure that it's really being addressed effectively yet. But we do know that we've identified a problem, which is that gap. So the, the challenge with the data that we go through is it gives us a snapshot, but you know we can make um, you know we can sort of identify some issues um, associated with it, um, but it doesn't give us a composite picture of what's really happening. What we're going to work on next in the data committee this week is uh, just a couple of high-level trends um, that help to tell the story a little bit more. Um, you know, uh, we did see uh, Dr. Valier's cut 
of uh, longitudinal analysis of use of force over time. So that would be a 20 year shot, what it really looks like over time. And it was very interesting because you can see it was at higher levels 20 years ago, and it's definitely significantly decreased over time. And so that does tell us that there have been intentions to, you know, re-examine or, um, or approach use of force differently, um, you know, across the spectrum of time. So these are some of the indicators that we'd like to bring into um, the planning session. I think the steps that Dia were talking about too, when you look longitudinally over that gap of time, there was the introduction of less lethal forces that came in. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the actual measurement of use of force morphed somewhat. So it would take someone like Peter to help us distill that to, to see if hands-on use of force is truly declining, or is there a subordinate or a substitute use of force that has gained traction? Nonetheless, it would still be good because we're moving away from physical violence to non-lethal forces um, to gain compliance. But I think it's still something that we need to understand um, that, that big picture, but then again, broken out individually by type of force or type of non-lethal force used. It's really tough to um, follow Brenda Leffler and Janine Hartro. They, they bring such an amazing narrative. Um, but if you do have questions or certainly um, you know, if uh, after this meeting you have some ideas or thoughts, please feel free to email me uh, or Margie or Whitney, um, and you know, we'd be happy to, to follow up. One interesting thing that I think as a committee we should contemplate um, as, as one of our firm recommendations is it's apparent that in recent years due to budget constraints, MMPD has stopped using an outside consultant to solicit and gain um, surveys. So the number, the number of surveys from any given precinct that Peter is using, the amount of um, statistical probabilities that he's having to overlay that with to sort of reflect an entire community um, really draws into question for me their accuracy. I know we can we can math them to death and get them pretty close, but there's nothing like spending the, I think from memory, what they said is magnitude 20 to $25,000 to have that outsourced, to really go into the community, to get true feedback, not from officers, not from 911 dispatchers, but um, a neutral third party to assemble the information. And I think our statistical data would be much more accurate and much more actionable uh, because of that. So that's certainly, a high ROI item for a city our size for $25,000, give or take a little. If there aren't any questions, I'll stop sharing my screen and turn the, send the ball back to uh, Margie. Uh, great, uh, Mr. Harris, do you have a question? Yes, on the um, on the uh, age distribution chart and all uh, by race, um, is that approximately we have what thousand four hundred and ninety four officers right now? Would that be yes? Mm -hmm. And so the the representation of African Americans is about eleven percent. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Sabina. Yeah, um, I, I had a question just looking at um, like the lower median age, say for Latinos. And um, I mean, is there a way of knowing how long the average service, um, you know, that Latinos have in the department? Like why does, why is the lower age? Is it just because? recruiting now or is it after so many years they end up uh, I don't know if that's data that's 
We can certainly just take a look to see based on the data that we have. We have quite a bit of data to see if over if, if we can just do a cut of that to see what what is the average tenure in the past yeah. of different demographic groups. Great. Gary on the phone, I don't want to leave you out. Have you got anything uh, you want to ask the data committee? Yes, ma'am. Just real quick, the the quote on excuse me, I think you said twenty thousand dollars. What 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 does that entail for the study? I think he said from my ex, from Peter's explanation, um, MMPD used to use a third party vendor that did the community surveys by precinct, and that way they would generate higher numbers of response or respondents um, because they would usually send interviewers into the community that represented the community and get more natural feedback. Um, they since have stopped that and they're doing it themselves now. And it's just probably challenging for the community to give honest feedback in a survey format to an officer or a cadet or someone that resembles an authority figure. So that was the $25,000, but that was a few years ago. I don't know what today's pricing would be, um, but I think it's a valuable investment. Okay, thank you. Okay, we got any other questions for data? What I, what I think is, is important um, about the age distribution is that will give us a good indicator of how long it's going to take the department um, to, uh, to, to change the percentages of uh, the, the demographics within the department. So um, understanding that either through attrition or um, retirement is the only way, you know, unless you increase the size of the department by two or 300. Um, and with our current budget issues, I don't necessarily see that happening. Um, only through attrition or retirement do you get the opportunity to hire in. And so obviously the younger um, uh, the majority are, the, the longer that's going to take. And so I think that's uh, why those numbers are particularly relevant for us in our discussions about uh, recruitment and culture um, and such. So any further questions about data before we move on? Okay, uh, I'd love to turn this over to Eric and John and get a little update from the mayor. To John, I have no, I have no announcements. Uh, John, I was hoping to, I was hoping to turn that over to you, Eric. So we're just focused on supporting your work right now. This sort of recommendations period is really critical. So we appreciate your focus this week, and you know, we're looking forward to seeing the draft recommendations that you come up with at the end of the week. Great, thank you, John. Um, I would like to just talk for a couple of minutes about some specific recommendations. Um, I felt like we had a lot of uh, conversation around recruitment, and I think I was able to catch, capture all that in the table um, format that that um, uh, that they want as a final. But I think what I'd love to get some more feedback on from the committee is what you're thinking about uh, promotion, retention, um, and culture. I think those are a little um, less clear to me. Um, I thought some of Janae's conversation about a readiness assessment, I, I think that seems, if you, especially if you're doing that early, you know, in years two and three, sergeants typically promote around three years. Um, that seemed like a really interesting concept to me. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear um, some thoughts from the committee just so I can start to take some things in and get some data in the table. Whitney and I'll toss it back and forth maybe in, in the next 24 hours um, and then send it out to the full committee so that you can, I think we wanna, my thought is we put everything in there in the kitchen sink and then call from there. So give me, give me some feedback. Thank <laughs> you. 
Mr. Harris. Yes, so Madam Chair, I think one um, feedback that I'd like to give on promotion gets at the heart of what Reggie talked about and with the marbles. And that is the promotion has to be intentional. Um, all things not being equal, sometime equal in, in, the, in the solution, you know, so um, I think the intentionality, you know, has to be brought to the forefront, you know, of promotion when it comes to getting uh, people of color and all into uh, higher positions. I thought what Janae said was interesting as well, Mr. Harris, about, you know, because um, for 100 years, the tie has gone to the white male. And so from now until whenever, until we get these numbers looking a little better, the tie is going to go to the minority. Um, if you've got, uh, if you've got somebody that's and, 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 and women, I like what you said. Yes. So uh, intentionality, I'm, I'm writing that down. Sabina, your hand was up. Well, just, uh, you know, that intentionality and promotion actually goes back to recruitment um, and improving recruitment strategies. Because when people see that their community members are in in the uh, police department and they're being promoted and it's a career, um, they're more likely to join. Because I, I know within some of the communities I work with, it's not seen as a career opportunity. So, um, and then, and then if we're talking about culture, of course, we need to go back and talk. I mean, it was great, the training that, um, that uh, the fair and impartial policing. Um, I, I, I was just wondering, obviously the department needs something like that, needs something on a regular basis. Uh, if you l listen to uh, Dr. Fitcher's uh, presentation on last, um, I guess last Thursday, she was saying like, you need these cultural competency training twice a year. And, and and is it happening at all? Like, and when they when they were talking about, oh, we look at what the current uh, anti bias training is. What is the current anti bias training at MNTD? I, I want to know because you know I know as a community member we come and train the cadets for one hour, <laughs> and and that's it. And I don't know of anything else going on. So what is already happening? If they're 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 coming in and they're kind of piggy banking on what's happening, what is happening, and how do we make that better? How do we make this? This has to come from the police chief, from the mayor. That is a priority. That um, you know that this anti bias training, cultural competency training, you know that is being happening. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that that part pieces in. And it's it's mandated in a regular intervals and 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 figuring out how would you because they cannot say how they were measuring the effect in, effectiveness of the training and if we don't measure the effectiveness all oh, this looks really nice on paper so how do we measure it um, and just figuring that out yeah I think the matrix. Um, is is really complicated and difficult. Uh, John, do you want to do you have something to add on that? Um, sure. And uh, Eric, do you jump in and, and correct my recollection here? Um, so uh, the in the academy, um, they do train on the fear and impartial policing uh, curriculum. They they send uh, trainers uh, off to be prepped in that, and that is part of their training curriculum. You know, one of the things that you'll hear from people at the academy and in terms of in-service training is that MNPD does double basically the requirement of Tennessee Post standards. Um, so there's uh, much more training on all of these issues than, than is required in the state of Tennessee. Um, I think that uh, sort of, I think that, you know, your comments about uh, the sort of uh, readiness assessment were really interesting. I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that um, the role of sergeants and training for sergeants and supervisors is absolutely critical. It's my impression that MNPD does a pretty good, does actually quite a good job of providing senior commanders with access 
to um, executive education opportunities at PERF and elsewhere. Um, you know, the training uh, is a very important issue. Um, I think that there is more evidence to suggest that sort of procedural justice training is has sort of clear results. The number of studies that demonstrated it is small, but the results are pretty strong. Uh, with fair and implicit bias, the, the sort of evidence of effectiveness is more limited. That doesn't mean it is or isn't. It just means it's not evidence-based in the way that procedural justice training is. So I think the opportunity to sort of think about and support, you know, really effective supervision is critical. And in terms of what the culture is, you know, what sergeants say at your roll call is huge. And, you know, I defer, Margie, definitely to you and your experience. I'd love to get your thoughts on, on sort of uh, that set of propositions. Yeah, when I was um, thinking about leading a department, um, my thought process was around when I when I think about um, frontline supervisors and up the chain, um, creating uh, a qualification sort of list or benchmarks that you had to reach before you got promoted. So in other words, you had to take these four classes, you had to have this many years in service, um, you know, your, your performance evaluations needed to be at a minimum, you know, of this. Um, but to do all that means you have to um, offer all those training classes and you've got to offer equal opportunity to get in those training classes. Um, and, uh, but through that sort of readiness process, you know that you're going to get somebody that comes in to supervision has been trained in management and coaching in you know performance evaluations and behavioral evaluations um, because too often and I think historically people in law enforcement get promoted and they are not trained at all it's just whoever has been there the longest whoever's fun to have lunch with um, and those are typically always white males um, and so some sort of, and I'm still a little <clears throat> concerned about Metro's uh, process of banding. I'm not sure I completely understand how they're doing promotions within bands. Maybe Reggie can speak to this. Um, I, I, I sort of like the list better, but I also understand that I think some of these testing procedures need to go through a cultural competency assessment um, because a, they may, they may not be culturally competent, and B, if there is an assessment center, that's where implicit bias comes in. Um, and so I'm just not, uh, and they could be doing it all right, John, as you say, I'm, I just don't know. Um, but providing some subjectivity within bands, I think is, is a little bit, concerns me just a little bit. Reggie, do you have anything to add on that? Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Um, like I said, one of the one of the disparities that we have found, um, okay, let's call it the first one. Let's call it going going down the numerical list. Uh, one of the disparities that, like I said, we we find that if there's only ten spots for a promotion, if if the chief says. I'm going to make 10 promotions. Usually your first 10, first 15, sometimes your first 20 are male whites. So you have a lack of diversity in the promotions based just basically solely on the numbers because there are a few women and there are a few minorities and there's a large number of male whites taking the test. So usually, you like I said, you might get one or two, um, and sometimes not even not even any. We've seen as many as thirty promotions at one time, and there was basically no minorities, and I think uh, there may have been one female out of thirty. I've we've, I've seen that in my career. So you have a very the uh, culture for sometimes getting promoted for women and minorities is, is very gloomy and it causes them not to want to take a promotional test next time 
because they feel like it's going to be the same thing over again. And sometimes the promotional test may not come up to another two to three years. So they kind of opt out of, of not wanting to take the promotion. The banding, basically, at one time, there was there was three bands. There was a, 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 a outstanding, a well-qualified, and a qualified. And basically what would happen is, if uh, let's say let's say 100 people took that test, the first 33 would be in the outstanding, the second 33 would be in the well qualified, and the third would be in the uh, just qualified. So if the if the chief uh, made 10 promotions out of that well qualified, 10 people from the next band would move up into that first band. So it still allowed some room for diversity. It allowed to be able to to be able to pick a minority uh, to help balance out the system that wasn't a that most chiefs could see wasn't a really good system because a lot of the times the numbers are um, the numbers just don't work in your favor. So really, what happened was. The, the fight was, this is the way that it is, and there is nothing that the chief says, there's nothing I can do about it. I have to promote this way. So uh, they left the chief's hands tied without him being able to create the diversity that he wanted to create. Uh, and, if, and if a chief did not create the diversity he wanted, then simp that was based on that chief, which means that that chief was choosing not to create that diversity because he had the option to do it. So the banding actually, I, I guess, kind of levels that playing field in a sense to say, I got, a, in, in this band, I have a Kurdish, I have Hispanic, I have, uh, you know, male blacks, I got female black. I'm, I'm going to be able to pick, you know, six of these out of the 20 so that I can help create diversity and have representation in the community. If that helps out. Marcy. It does. The, it does. The, the negative Nellie in me, though, says that a chief could also reach down and pick the six white males. Because that's certainly what they we've seen them do in the past. But I, I do, I do take your point ex, um, exactly. I think Marcy, can I jump in for a moment? Oh, of course. Yes. Go ahead, Daryl. You know, in, in hearing yourself and Reggie, I can sense the frustration, it would seem that we would need to look back at the testing procedures themselves, because the testing, if we're to make them gender neutral and not implicit or explicitly bias, then it's a number. And if we were to use the Minneapolis theory, which is when all things are equal, we pick the minority, whatever that minority might look like, because I, 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 I'm just not comfortable conceding to the fact that females and, and minorities test worse than white males. That I don't think any of us are really willing to accept that as a theory, should the tests be accurate, right? So if we want to solve the problem, we need to strip out of the testing process both gender and race, and the number is the number. And if we're spending time and energies to make sure that the tests are accurate and we're doing a good career building and, and they're called career paths for young officers, you know, if you know you want to be uh, a sergeant, here's your career path. Check these 15 boxes, put in these number of hours. Um, so I don't know that any of us would want to actually say that females and minorities test worse than white males. So I would have to say or conclude, then the test is not good. Um, okay, so I want to follow up on something that most of the time um, your testing company comes to the comes to the Metro Police Department and say we want to we don't uh, we, we need all the uh, your policies your procedures and, and we need your basically your subject matter experts. And then that particular company uh, uh, basically composed those questions for um, for approval for the police department. And those are usually the questions that uh, are given on a test. 
However, I, you know, but they have to, they utilize people actually in the police department. So I'm also saying that there are people in the police department that actually know what the test questions are going to be as well. The other point I'm going to, I want to make is that um, when it comes, I, I agree with you that uh, we have plenty of, of test takers that are good, that are females, that are minorities. The problem that most people don't even really realize in a test, the difference between one number, let's say the difference between an 89 and a 90 might be 15 people because the numbers that you will receive is not you made an 89 and I'm, I'm, you made a 90 and I made an 89. What happened is this person made an 89.2467 and this other person made an 89.3.263 and it goes in these numbers just go up and up and up. So between one number, just one number alone, you could have as many as 15 people. It doesn't mean that you didn't score well. It doesn't mean that you didn't do good because a 93 might have you at number 37. So those numbers, are, but the, there's always a you know, numbers behind your original number, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, 89 point something, 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 or 90, 90 point two, three, four, six, seven. There's all these numbers that behind. So you don't, you know, two people making an 89, two people making an 89, they both don't make the same score because it's an 89 point something, something, something. So there's still this big difference between the numbers. So uh, just know that as well. Am I to understand that you're saying the numbers are different and they're based on gender or race? or the numbers are different based on the person's ability to test, or the test is flawed because I saw Margie shaking her head that some people know the answers or the questions, then that strikes me to my point that I said originally, which is A, get a new testing company because I've never heard of such a thing. And uh, B, then you have to, I mean, it would be, unless we're shifting gears as an organization, we want to start taking not the top of the, the pyramid and not the bottom, but we want to make a concerted effort to take everybody that's in the range of 70 and pull all of the average people to the top as our leaders. Short of that, I don't know that any organization ever does anything but take from the top performers. So if we can equalize the ability to perform, shouldn't the top performers win unless there's a tie, which then should go to a minority? or female, that seems like a fair system if we're to unify the testing process. Madam Chair, it's Gary Moore. Go ahead, Gary. A couple of things, I'd like to get back on recruitment, but before we go there, I'll, I'll stick with promotions for a moment. First of all, it's kind of sad to hear that a testing is done with input from somebody within the department. Most Testing should be done by an outside agency, and they are standardized tests that are given across the country. Those are the kind of tests that should be given. But I do like uh, the idea of a chief having the authority to have a range, if you would, I'll use that word, to move them. That gives him or her a little bit of leeway authority to know this individual may have scored 95 or 99 on the test, but he knows what they how they perform out in the field. And their performance out in the field, they may have minimal, minimal qualifications to take the test, but they're not the ideal candidate. And he or she may know that. So that gives them a little bit of discretionary right within a range. It also gives them some discretionary right to hire minorities within a range. Uh, so I would certainly hope that Metro would have outside agencies come and do the test that nobody is privy to what, how the test is written and what to expect. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, and, and once we get through with uh, the uh, promotion stuff, I'd like to come back to recruitment and retention. Yeah, I think what I'm saying is I would love to see um, somebody do an assessment on the cultural competency of the test. 
um, and just look at look at that to see that it was um, um, culturally competent. Um, but I, I take Reggie's point, which is um, the bands do give the chief some flexibility and that could be a good thing or that it could, that it could give the chief flexibility and it could be the wrong thing. So, um, but, but that's, you know, that, that has to do with the stated goals of the department, I guess. So does anybody have anything else on promotion for this discussion? I think Gary, you wanted to go back to recruitment for a minute. Uh, go ahead, Reggie. No, that wasn't me. Uh, this, it was clicking. Um, quick question. So who has the authority and all to change the, the procedures or, yeah, the, the, the postal companies, the procedures of the test? Uh, if it's not the chief, it would be Metro HR, I guess. Um, John, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know for sure. I do know that Metro HR is the manager of uh, promotional lists and so forth, so it could be in their purview. This, can you hear me this, Gary? Yes, sir, go ahead. I don't know for sure what somebody from on the police department may know, but I think the police department has their own HR. They may re be responsible for it, but even if they are, that's something I think they should pass along to Metro HR to handle any kind of promotional exams. And it should be, and again, in my opinion, it should be done from an outside independent agency. They do have their own HR department, but the promotional list resides at Metro HR. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so does anybody want to weigh in quickly? I know we've been on for a couple hours. Um, give me some quick feedback on culture. Go ahead, Demetria. Uh, it sort of caught me when um, the ladies talked about the mood of the room when they come to the bias training. And some people, you could see the spells and the crossed arms and so forth. And I'm wondering how people are segregated to train. Like, do they consist of different years on the force and new people, old people, et cetera? And is there always diversity in those training groups? Because that once a year training is so important. If it's just made up with the kind of people that are going to be a brick wall, um, I think we have to be really intentional about how those groups are, are segregated and for the effectiveness of that training that's so important. Okay, have we got anything else? Um, let's just do a quick check-in. Does anybody have anything to add uh, before we finish the call? Whitney? No, nothing for me. Gary, have you got anything on the phone? Yes, ma'am, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, real quick, I'll, I'll be real quick on it, but I'm on the retention and recruitment. I think we can tie the two together by saying it would simply uh, increase the um, the pay, the starting pay, and <clears throat> increase the benefit. And of course, some of the stuff you have already addressed is network conditions and, and fair promotional process. And I'll go back to work conditioning. Y'all have touched on quite a bit about the uh, supervisors and but that's from the complaints that I've heard from the police officers that's left. They left because of management, so called had their thumb on them so much they were afraid to do anything. So you're looking at that. So I think you can tie recruitment and retention to better pay and of course better working conditions. Thank you. 
Well, and I always like to say, if you're going to raise the start pay 5% or 7% or whatever that you have to raise everybody up the scale. Otherwise you're talking about a compression pay scale. Um, and it, that, that drives police officers absolutely crazy. Um, when you continue to raise the start pay and you don't raise anybody else, you'll end up with an officer that's been on a year making more than an officer that's been on five years. I've seen it happen. Um, and then that is just deadly for uh, morale and for retention. So um, I take your I take your um, suggestion, Gary, but I'm gonna, if you don't mind, um, say that um, we're gonna just increase pay across the board X percent. And that every time you re you increase start pay, you've got to increase up the scale. Okay, so next week uh, we are still working on subject matter experts. We're hoping to have um, a testimony by the silent no longer folks. Um, I think we are still working on an LGBTQ. Um, uh, SME to come and talk to it, uh, talk to us. I was glad to hear uh, Brenda talk about LGBTQ um, in some of her statements um, as it relates to implicit bias. Um, uh, and that will be it for our subject matter experts. We're quickly moving into the phase of trying to finalize our recommendations. Um, does anybody else uh, see a gap in in the knowledge that we currently have to be able to make some good recommendations. You can certainly uh, email Whitney and I offline if you have any concerns uh, and we'll try to get those addressed. Uh, seeing nothing else, I will uh, close the meeting just by saying that uh, Whitney and I will be emailing you the drafts um, in the next 24 hours. Uh, and let's start to, to to kind of fine tune those so we can turn in uh, a good product on Friday. All right. Thank you very much. Seeing nothing further, uh, we'll, we'll, Whitney, did you have anything? I don't know. I'm just waiting. Bye. <laughs> okay. All right. Good night, everybody. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.